I would like you to turn to the second chapter of the book of the Revelation. We are beginning seven messages to seven churches. And the first church is the church at Ephesus. Ephesus is the first church on what was known as a postal route. And as we go through each successive church, it was a literal road that was used by the Romans to deliver documents, uh, tax notices, tax receipts. So Ephesus was the first of the seven, and it was without question the most prominent of the seven churches. Revelation chapter two, beginning at verse one. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. There are two portraits of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. I want to quote one writer who said this, they, that is the portraits, introduce magnificent studies in contrast. The first, chapter one, verses nine through 20, which were read this morning, cast the savior as the comforting Lord of the church, bringing encouragement to John and timely reminders to the churches during troubled times. The second masterpiece, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, pictures the king of kings as lord of the earth, coming to forcefully, permanently reclaim his kingdom from unbelieving rebels. These two scenes do not present an either or approach to understanding the real Jesus. Rather, they reveal the both and person of Christ. The former still comforts the church today, while the latter terrifying moments still await fulfillment in the future. Still comforting those today. I got an email this morning, and I get one every single morning from a particular news source that talked about what is going on in Afghanistan today for Christians. It's horrible. They are searching for Bibles, apps on cell phones, murdering Christians at wholesale, purging a culture. Now, we haven't seen that in this country. Perhaps we will. Jesus knows exactly what's going on in Afghanistan amongst his people. 
Do remember them in prayer as you think about it. And thank God for the privileges that we have still in this country to be able to gather like this without fear of persecution, reprisals, but things could change. Be prepared. Trust in God and his ability to deal with adversity. The church at Ephesus, we know quite a bit about it. Uh, the church of Ephesus was started by a husband and wife team named Priscilla and Aquila at the conclusion of the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey, roughly around 50 years A.D. It was firmly established by the Apostle Paul while on his third missionary journey, Paul spent approximately three years preaching and teaching the Ephesian church. He met in what was called the School of Tyrannaeus. And he taught, and he taught a lot. Day in, day out, the truths about the gospel, the things that he had received from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This church established elders in chapter 20. It was a church that received one of the epistles in our New Testament canon, the epistle to the Ephesians, which reminded the congregation at Ephesus of God's sovereign grace in the calling of them out of darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. One of the deepest epistles of the New Testament. The church is again mentioned here some 40 years later, as one of the churches that the Lord stood in the midst of and wanted the message sent to the angel of that church. The Ephesian church had taken on a spiritual personality that was unique from the other six churches that are mentioned. Jesus noted some very, very positive traits of this church. He also mentions one glaring weakness. They had left their first love. Because of persecution, John was banished to the island of Patmos. And that's where John received the revelation. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now John evidently had ended up in what is modern day Turkey at Ephesus, coming from Jerusalem all the way to Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. And John became a vital part of that church. Think of it, if you will, written somewhere between 90 and 95 AD, the last of the original apostles. Think of that. And the church knew that. And they were blessed to have John. And persecution began to reign in Asia Minor in particular. And churches were oftentimes closed down, martyrdom, and in some cases, banishment to prisons, as the case was with John. So this Ephesian church was a church that had a great history in existence for somewhere between 40 and 45 years. It is evaluated by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a busy church that it needed to pay attention to what Jesus was going to say about them. And this passage begins by stating this, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The same vision, by the way, that Pastor Jonathan preached about last week. Jesus held seven stars in his hand 
And he walked among seven golden lampstands, depicting the seven churches. The seven stars are referred to as angels. Now there is some debate or disagreement amongst Bible teachers. Are these literal angels? Or are they, as the word, if it is translated, messengers? I personally take the view that I think they are messengers, probably one of the key elders of a church. But regardless, if they're angelic beings, they still received the message. Jesus is depicted as one who stands in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, a picture, if you will, of one who is over the seven lampstands, and he knows exactly what is going on within each and every church. And we need to be reminded of that. Jesus today knows exactly what the Grace Brethren Chapel stands for. He knows what we have endured, but he also knows perhaps shortcomings that we as a corporate body may exhibit, at least to him. So this is a, an important teaching for us to recognize Jesus is aware. Let me read something to you, if I may. This is written by the late M.R. DeHaan. And he was the founder of the Radio Bible Class. And many years ago, I got a little booklet from them and called, Let's Talk Turkey. In other words, let's talk about what went on in Turkey. Let's talk frankly. And he said this regarding the Ephesian church. If you were to visit the ruins of ancient Ephesus, you might find it hard to imagine that they represent a city which at one time was the most active and important cities of Asia Minor. It was built near the mouth of the Castor River. It had one of the busiest inland harbors on the Aegean coast. Even by New Testament times, the city was in trouble. The environment was a problem back then, even as it is now. Some feel that heavy timbering and overgrazing of the land, particularly on the hills, resulted in the topsoil, topsoil being washed into the river and unloaded in the Ephesian harbor. Large amounts of money and energy were invested in attempts to keep the waterways open, and for a while they were successful, but eventually the city lost the battle. The Castor River quickly and steadily deposited tons and tons of silt and sand into shipping lanes, until finally the commercial lifelines of Ephesus were choked off. The harbor turned into a marshland, and then eventually a reedy plain. Today, listen to this, today the ruins of Ephesus stand seven miles inland. M. R. Dehan goes on to say, in many ways, the city was an object lesson of a problem experienced by the church that lived there. Once one of the strongest spiritual communities in Asia, she, like the harbor city that grudgingly hosted her, became cluttered with material that gradually choked off her lifeline. How do we know that? We know it by listening to the words of the founder of the church, Jesus Christ. What do you say to a busy evangelical church? Here's the first thing that we need to know. Busy church, you need to look at your Lord. And that's the call. So when the Ephesians received this letter, it begins with these words. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. That's the one who's speaking. That's the one who in the previous chapter was depicted in all his glory. What a description of Jesus. Eyes that burnt like fire, feet that were like burnished bronze in a furnace. Powerful description. 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. A second thing, busy church, realize that your Lord is looking at you. This is what the major part of the lesson focuses upon to the Ephesian church. They needed to realize that Jesus was giving an evaluation of what he saw. Now that's, that's pretty humbling. It's pretty humbling from the perspective that it was accurate. There was no denying it. There's no fleeing from it. They had to accept what Jesus saw. And probably when they received this letter, the elders who read it probably were the most humbled. Because they probably had overlooked this weakness in their own life. We allowed the church to get to the point where love was not being manifest. And here's what it says. In chapter one and verse two, it says, I know your deeds. Your toil, perseverance. And I know that you can't tolerate evil men. That's a good thing. You put those to the test who call themselves apostles. You were trained well by your elders. You were trained well by the apostle John. They called themselves elders and they were not. And you found them to be false. And you have this great trait. You have perseverance. And you've endured for my name's sake. And, and you haven't grown weary. Those are all positive checklists. And in verse six, he goes on to say, yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Those are the positive things. The all discerning eyes of the Lord Jesus are fully aware of the efforts of this church, its successes, and also, as we'll find out, its failures. This church invested into the lives of their people. They performed many good deeds. They toiled diligently. They persevered in righteousness and truth. They effectively practiced biblical church discipline. They tested the spirits and the spirit of truth. They affirmed the apostles' doctrine. They endured for the name of Jesus. They did not grow weary in well-doing. They stood against the immorality so commonly practiced in Ephesus. In Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the temple of Diana. It was a temple of a grotesque woman goddess. I believe it was 40 foot tall, made of gold with many breasts. It was, it was part of the cult of Diana worship. So immorality was prevalent in that culture. They stood against it. The church was busy keeping error out and opposing false teachings. These things were commended by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, Jesus points to one glaring sin. This is found amidst the many accolades given by the Lord to the church. And in verse four, if you look at that, it says this, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. That you have left your first love. Now we, we would probably send negotiators to Jesus today. We would probably want to say, but Lord, look, look, they're under pressure. Persecution? Yeah, they're lacking in some love, but you know, 
Uh, they just need a little encouragement and they'll, they'll be all right. And then Jesus would look at us with eyes like fire and that would give us the x-ray vision and we would understand, no, Pastor John, you're entirely wrong. I know my churches. I know the seriousness of the problem. What you view as a surface problem is really a heart problem. And it's causing great, great trouble. Robert Mounts, who wrote an excellent commentary on Revelation, said this, Good works and pure doctrine are not adequate substitutes for the rich relationship of mutual love shared by persons who have just experienced the redemptive love of God. The congregation founded by the Apostle Paul is now, it is indicated as having left its first love. It does not say they lost their love. Be clear about that. They have left their love. They've moved away from the priority of love. It's interesting. Look at the very first word in verse 4. In the English, it's translated but. In the Greek, there are two primary words translated but. One is the word de, which is a common conjunction. The other is the word used here, Allah. It is a word that is used when there is strong contrast. All the positive things that they did. Now Jesus says, but. In contrast to all that you have done, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. What does that mean that you've left your first love? And you know, as I, I read many commentators on this, there's a common denominator amongst all of them. They had something and they moved away from it. Now to name the particulars, there are numerous opinions. This does not appear to be a fast departure, but a slow, gradual leaving. It is a drifting. It's an eroding. Time and circumstances seem to have led the church to drift away from the love element. Now, I don't think there's a better illustration of this. I mean, if you want to get down to what is an example of leaving your first love or the devotion to it. Barbara Streisand's song, You Don't Bring Me Flowers Anymore. That's as good a song as there is. Listen, you don't bring me flowers. You don't sing me love songs. You hardly talk to me anymore. When I come through the door at the end of the day, I remember when you couldn't wait to love me. You used to hate to leave me. Now, after loving me, loving me at night, when it's good for you, babe, and you're feeling all right, you just roll on over and turn out the light. And you don't bring me flowers anymore. It used to be so natural. It used to be, well, you don't talk about it anymore. Hmm, but used to bees don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. And baby, I remember all the things you taught me. I learned how to laugh and I learned how to cry. Well, I learned how to love and I learned how to lie. So you think I could learn how to tell you goodbye? So you think I could learn how to tell you goodbye? You don't bring me flowers anymore. 
Well, you think I could learn. Because you don't say you need me. You don't sing me love songs. You don't bring me flowers anymore. Who was the last person married in our church? Let's see. Right back there. Do you remember the weeks and months coming up before your wedding? Yeah. Did you think about a whole lot else? No. You go on a honeymoon, you come back, and boy, you got all these gifts to open, everything's going great. I'm sure you haven't had any arguments as of yet. Sharon's parents uh, couldn't be here this morning, but they've been married 65 years. And if I was to ask them, are you still in love? I know what they would say. Yes. They are still in great love. But if we're all honest as married people, what causes the drifting from the love and the excitement, the anticipation and the bringing of flowers and preparing a new fancy meal or whatever. What, what gets in the way? You could fill in the blanks because it's, it's probably true of all of us. There are things that get in the way. The kind of love that is spoken of here is agape love the love used most often to describe the New Testament Christian love demonstrated by Jesus. The Ephesians had exchanged a prominent love for a peripheral love. That's a quote from Dr. Richard Mayhew. They had exchanged a preeminent, prominent love for a peripheral love. Do you remember when you first became a Christian? I do. 50 years ago. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Man, did things change. I had a hunger. I wanted to be there Wednesday night. We didn't have meals back then, other than a meal prepared out of the book. I couldn't wait to be with the Christians. Chapel was small, about the size of that section of the church. Pastor Thomas was not an expositor per se. I always say he had 10 sermons and 10 variations of those sermons. But I learned how he loved people. I learned how he put a garden in back of the chapel, big garden, about half the size of the sanctuary garden that he used to till by hand with a shovel. He said, it's all in the shovel and the wrists. He was a little skinny guy. He said, I did the garden so I could give vegetables to the neighbors. And he did. That was just the way he was. And people would appreciate that. People would appreciate his kindness. Are churches today in danger of losing their first love? Yes. Churches are, are in danger of that. It's easy to go through motions. Husband and wives, how much time do you spend talking? Christian, how much time do you spend talking? Dr. Mehu goes on to state this. There are three directions of love. Christ begins with the upward love in the Gospels. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
It's the love directed toward the Father and Son. It's the affection that actively seeks to deepen our relationship with God rather than the human tendency to become more involved with religion. Religion can be a substitute for intimacy with God. So you have that upward love toward God when you obey his commandments. That's an illustration or an example or the proof of real love. If you don't want to obey God's commandments, don't think you're fooling him. You're not fooling him. You can't fool him. So there's the upward love, but then there's the inward love, the love of the brethren. Love one another even as I have loved you. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said that in John 13, right after he had washed his disciples' feet and they had communion. A loss of this love focuses on church buildings and programs rather than the importance of body life of the church. The ultimate of this love is sacrifice. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. The Ephesians needed to reemphasize that. That sacrificial love is in serving one another. Thank you deacons and deaconesses for your labors of love in serving our church. And not just them. We have a lot of servants in this church. And thank you. So there's the upward love, there's the inward love, and there's the outward love. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. John chapter 20, verse 21. The Father sent the Son, and the Son is now commissioning the church. He's commissioning the church to a world that is loveless, has no clue about what is before them at death if they do not repent and follow Christ. The lack of love is usually demonstrated by more desire to do things than to actually sacrifice in an attempt to outreach in our culture. How did the church get to this point? How did the church get to the point where they left their first love? And I thought a lot about this. Well, 40 to 45 years had gone by and the establishment of the Ephesian church was now into the third generation. If you figure about 10 to 15 years per generation. They're into the third generation. Perhaps the love had not been demonstrated by older saints. Maybe it hadn't been emphasized by the elders. Maybe persecution was becoming so oppressive that they were mad at the Lord. Oh, that's not possible. Oh, yes, it is. Striving within the midst of persecution may have become one of the key points that they focused upon. Is it worth following Jesus in the midst of persecution? That was one of the questions that Ronnie raised in our Sunday school class today. Do you know many people who profess to be Christians because of the fear of death? They surrendered their copies of Scripture. They denied the Lord and they were willing to burn incense to Caesar. Tasks, even good ones, become the primary focus. But as the Lord points out, 
love was left out. You know, to love people properly, it takes time, it takes focus, it takes commitment. Well, you don't know how busy I am. I hear that all the time. No, I don't know how busy you are, but I do know this. The average person today, cell phone, six hours. Average teen, nine hours. Please, don't try to fool Pastor John that you don't have time. And by the way, you might be able to fool me, but you certainly can't fool the Lord. We're in a great cultural upheaval in America. People are more concerned about, oh, I just got another text. Oh, I got another one. Who said that? Does that thumbs up or thumbs down? Are we being manipulated to where we can't even think any longer and the heart can't open itself up to this book because we don't have time to read it? Look, the third point here is busy church, church, look at what is required. In verse 5, remember... Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and remove and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Was Jesus serious about that? Would Jesus remove the lampstand out of Ephesus? There is no Christian church in Ephesus today. Hasn't been for centuries. Jesus tells the church, remember from where you have fallen, repent or change your mind and return and do the deeds. Jason, did you start your paper yet on counseling? Stop. Start. Repent. And start doing the deeds you did at the first. Remember from where you have fallen. To remember, reflect. Notice what it was like. Just like in that Barbara Streisand song, to reflect upon what used to be, man, it used to bring me flowers. Ladies, if you all get flowers this week, just send a note of thanks. <laughs> it's so simple, isn't it? I mean, just an example like that. To remember means to reflect upon what was. From where you have fallen. There must have been a recognizable point where some, at some point things went down. Jesus implies they had the ability to reflect upon it. The verb you have fallen is a perfect tense. Now perfect tenses, I know, I know. I never liked English. This is Greek. Perfect tenses were used to show something that happened in the past that has an enduring result into the present. You left your first love and there are definitely results. The church here is called to remember its earlier days in which love abounded in the congregation, memory can be pow a powerful force in effecting a return to a more satisfying relationship. First love is pictured as a height from which the church had fallen. Chapel's been in existence over 50 years. Yeah. 
The Ephesian church did not know that it had fallen. Being deceived is a very dangerous thing. Do you know why being deceived is a dangerous thing? Because you don't know that you're deceived. Is it possible that some of us individuals or even the church, God forbid, would be deceived? You bet it's possible. When I first became a Christian, there wasn't anything I wouldn't do for Jesus. Including cut my hair, if you can believe that. As I had long hair. I, I would do anything. I remember the first time I understood that Christians gave money when they passed the plate around. And I can remember pulling out my wallet. I didn't know how much to give because I never thought about it. So I, I, I gave some money. I was really happy to give it. And then I found out, well, that's what Christians do. Not because you have to do it, but because you want to do it. Why do you want to do it? Well, because it furthers the work of the church and of the gospel and of the, the kingdom of God. Remember from where you have fallen and repent. The word repent here confirms something. Jesus was talking about sin. You don't repent unless sin is involved. There was sin in the church at Ephesus. Well, wait a minute, I read all those positive things. There was sin at the church in Ephesus. Do the deeds you did at the first. Do the deeds. True love manifests itself in action. The planting of churches in the New Testament from the first church in Jerusalem to the church at Ephesus seem to manifest certain deeds. Think of it. They boldly penetrated their communities beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the other most parts of the earth. They developed well-defined priorities and they practice an uncommon preoccupation with one another's welfare as an expression of inward love. Very, very significant. They possess a supreme sense of God's holiness and an expression of upward love. They manifested the highest standards for spiritual leadership in which a congregation submitted as an expression of inward love in the church. And they were willing to die for Christ's sake as an expression of their loyalty to the Lord Jesus. The truth of the matter is this. Churches are still churches. Churches still deal with the same issues. Dr. MacArthur said these words from his book, Remember and Return. Loving the Lord Jesus is what Christ, the Christian life is all about. If you're a Christian, a true Christian, you love Christ. Ultimately, your love is subject to a fluctuation in its intensity. And that's where probably all of us are at at some point or another. We love Jesus, but but sometimes it fluctuates in its intensity. It takes a focused commitment on your part to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The story is told by Christian social critic Oz Guinness about his last visit to the bedside of one of the great theologians John R. Stott. And Os Guinness tells that when he was with John Stott, he asked Dr. Stott if he wanted him to pray for anything. In his weak, whispering voice, Dr. Stott said, Please pray. 
that I'll be faithful to Christ to my very last breath. Here he is dying. That was his prayer. Please pray for that, that I'll be faithful to my very last breath. What does leaving the first love look like? Interest in what pleases Jesus isn't as as important as it was in earlier days. New passions replace the original interest of pleasing Jesus. Now granted, Jesus, Jesus knows this, brethren. Stephen, Caitlin, Jesus knows that you don't have kids yet. If you start having kids, obviously you're going to spend more time helping with the children and rearing them. He knows there may be problems with broken down cars. Everybody has that experience. He knows that as we mature in life, we take on more responsibilities. But the original interest has to still be there. The burning fire that's within us that I, I, will, I will honor Jesus at the cost, whatever it costs. We make priority choices that, that, that tell the Lord, Lord, you first. The second thing, Bible reading and prayer evaporate from the normal regimen of the Christian experience. Let me tell you a pastoral secret. And it won't be a secret anymore. This is normal for today. When our pastors find themselves involved in serious counseling situations, one of the common questions we ask is this. How often do you read your Bible? And you know what the most common answer is? I don't. that surprise you? Ask yourself the question, do you read your Bible? Are you the weak link in the church? We've all heard the expression, a chain is only as strong as its weak, weakest link. What does that mean? It's going to break at some link. Don't be the, the weak link in the chain. We find that most people commonly say, I'm just too busy, I don't have time to read or pray. One of the key battlegrounds is extreme juggling of things that we have taken on, sometimes necessary, but sometimes not so necessary. We have supposedly new time-saving devices. As Os Guinness said, our time-saving has become our time-slaving. We've all become Darwinians now, for we live by the survival of the fastest. Well, if I just get this new thing, or that new thing, it'll help me do this or that, and now we're, we're, we're strapped to maintain this, and do this, and do that, that by the end of the day, all we've done is lubed the gears and filled the tires of all the things that suck our time. Wow. But that's the way it is. New interests replace old loyalties. I think that's what happened in the church at Ephesus. Now, I'm going to give you a couple recommendations that I, I think, as I really thought about this, I had to think about Pastor John first. I remember an old Plymouth Brethren pastor said this. All pastors know this. Pastor is like a cow. 
He must chew the cud before he gives the milk. So it has to go through the heart of the pastor so he can honestly give it to the sheep. I thought about four words that to me caused me to really dial back in to the most important things. One of them is the word forgiveness. Recovering the forgiveness in Christ is crucial in recovering our first love. Do you remember the story where Jesus summarizes the end of it by saying, he who has been forgiven much loves much? Have you forgotten how much God has forgiven you? Do we live flippantly as if, well, God kind of owed it to me. No, he didn't owe you anything but judgment. Living in the light of Christ's love for us cultivates in our hearts our love for God and for others. I love the hymn. I thought of a hymn. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Be my glory ever until my raptured soul has found rest beyond the river. Keep me near the cross. Why? Because the cross reminds us that we would be nothing without the cross of Jesus Christ. So forgiveness is, is, is a great word. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Psalm 100 and verse 4. Thankfulness to God is a recognition that God in his goodness and faithfulness has provided for us and cared for us, both physically and spiritually, it is a recognition that we are totally dependent upon him, that all that we are and have comes from him. You might think, well, no, it's, it's I got to go to work at third shift. I hate working third shift. I wouldn't tell any other Christian this, but I hate third shift and I'm mad at God, really. Really? Have you ever thought about what it would be like if you didn't work on the third shift? That maybe you wouldn't be able to drive or afford a car? The hymn I thought of was Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. A third word, rejoice. It's hard to rejoice when you feel down, discouraged. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect work so that you may be mature, lacking in nothing. It's not that you thank God for the sickness, the loss of a job, but you thank God because he is sovereign and he is working in your life to conform you to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seven times in the book of Philippians, the church is encouraged to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We don't rejoice in the fact that persecution is coming or, or things are going bad. We rejoice in the Lord. We can rejoice in the Lord because it will, it will only get better. Never, never will it get worse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. I got a feeling the Ephesian church had forgotten that. Persecution had eroded them. 
like the sandcastle on the beach as the high tide comes in. And they probably were discouraged. The hymn I thought of for that was Rejoice, the Lord is King, written by Charles Wesley, put into the first hymn book of John Wesley. Between the two of them, they wrote 5,000 Christian hymns. And here's another one, the word heavenly. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3 state this. While it doesn't mention the word heavenly, you'll catch the point. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. If you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God, have we forgotten that, brethren? We're in Christ. We're in Christ. Regardless of what happens here, glory is there to greet us. Amen? Yes, the church of Ephesus church at Ephesus. We don't know how they responded immediately. I, I got to believe that they probably did repent. And I got to believe that the power of the word of God was the reason they repented. They saw the book of the Revelation. They saw the picture of Jesus. They saw his x-ray vision in their midst. And he could look right at their hearts. They saw that coming through the great tribulation, those who were martyrs and those who would press on would receive the crown of life. And they saw that we would ultimately all be conquerors in Christ. Now that's why it is profitable to read the book of the Revelation, not to find out the mystery and how maybe we fit in exactly, or you know, do we go through the tribulation or not? That's not the main point of the book of the Revelation. The main point is Jesus Christ is above all and he is the victor and we have life in him and we are the victors. Let's pray.